here. But for now, we'll go back to our view from the top of Sinai, and as you can see here, the valley floor below is enormous and well able to contain the huge numbers comprising those who came out of Egypt. About halfway up the eastern face of Sinai is this hidden valley that can't be seen from below. Exodus 24, 9 and 10 tells us of a meeting of the Lord with Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel. They saw God at a distance and as it were a pavement of sapphire under his feet. And glancing upward to where the glassy blackness appears, it's not difficult to imagine a deep blue shine here from the glory of the Lord. Looking all the way down into the camp, we get our first glimpse of the altar to the golden calf. Fenced and forbidden by the Saudis to enter, we would have to devise a plan to get close-up footage of this on another trip. In the same manner, close into the base of Sinai, we saw the clear image of a double wall corral leading up to a slaughter area and an altar of earth and uncut stone. Just behind the altar is a dry stream bed running from the mountain all the way into the valley below. Moses cast the remnants of the golden calf into the brook that came out of the mount, according to Deuteronomy 9.21. Here you can see the fence that the Saudis have erected to keep people out of this area. It is extensive and encloses a guard outpost visible here. They are quite serious about keeping the eyes of the world off this mountain. Wow. That is a lot of information. <laughs> and, and that's three minutes of six of the roll-ins that we've brought. Uh -huh. But it is a tremendous amount of information. And, and to watch that just, you know, it brings it back so vividly in my mind. It gives me chills to see uh, just how this is preserved. And we're going to get in further into each one of the um, areas that we talked about. The golden calf altar, a place where Moses built the altar where he sacrificed oxen. The pillars that he erected, each one representing one of the 12. So we, we're going to see that as well. Um, it became very apparent to us that they had no intention of allowing this information uh, to leave that country. Sure. So it became very clear to us that our mandate then must be getting a film record of what is there. Um, film and uh, still photography and anything we could just in case they ever decided to eradicate it Mm -hmm. I would hope and pray that they would never do such a thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the geopolitical climate we live in right now, where all the earth seems to want to wipe Israel off mm -hmm. the map, um, I'm not well convinced that they would not try to rid themselves of any sort of right. Israeli history. Mm -hmm. Well, they did it on so, the Temple Mount. Why not? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And now they claim the Temple didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So uh, Let's bring up photos 2 yeah. through 10. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of just step through these, maybe a couple seconds each. Okay. And uh, that is our original slide. There we go. Oh, That's there we go. This is the mountain that we do believe is the real Mount Sinai. We're looking from the north to the south. It's actually called Jebel Makla. And you can see it's a very different color from all the surrounding mountains. Mm -hmm. um, there's argument as to whether or not it's charred black or whether that's just natural basalt. But um, to us, there's so many other region, uh, reasons why this mountain is the real Mount Sinai. It's almost a moot point to us. <laughs> but if you go ahead and bring up the next one, this we believe is Mount Horeb. Uh, this is properly called Jebel Laws. It's about from peak to peak, what, about five miles? About five miles across. Um, the area is enormous. Uh, this Jebel Laws, uh, we believe sincerely, is Mount Horeb uh, for a lot of different reasons, but one of which is there is something in the Bible calls the uh, Rock of Horeb. You never hear it spoken of as the Rock at Sinai. Mm -hmm. And if you make Sinai and Horeb the same mountain, then you've got a problem with where you locate the okay. rock that Moses struck that the waters came from, mm -hmm. which we'll be able to show you, uh, we believe, pretty clearly here just shortly. Next slide. But uh, these two mountains, it's interesting, that, that is Jim right there that you see. Uh, September 24th of 1992, we finally made it to the top of what we believe to be Sinai. And you can see the distance now uh, where the arrow's pointing. We believe that is Horeb, and that split no rock is on the No problem with the guards the going up side. there? Oh, yeah, there were problems. There <laughs> we managed to figure out other ways to get up there. Okay. <laughs> well, we didn't there go from the front. We would drive around to the back. Jump out, of the, jump out of the truck, 
with hide backpacks the on, hide the hide truck, the and run as fast as we could to get away from the truck and disappear up into the mountains. Mm -hmm. and we've spent we five days to... camping in the mountains, so we would be away from the vehicle quickly, and that would give us a chance to get up and, uh, you know, and to hide ourselves. Um, and it just happens to be on that, you saw September 24th, 1992. Mm -hmm. That was my 38th birthday, so I was blessed wow. by God to be able to spend my birthday waking up on the top of Mount Sinai, which was an incredible experience. Go ahead and bring up the next slide. This is uh, actually from the top of that mountain that you saw across the valley, which we call Horeb. We managed to climb to the top of it. If you notice the date, and this was happens chance, these are the type of God things that happened to us. That is September 24th of 94. That happened to be my 40th birthday. <laughs> so we were able to spend my 40th birthday on top of the uh, other peak, which is what we call yeah. Mount Horeb. And you can see real clearly right there um, how very different that the black whole, that whole mountain is very different from all the surrounding mountains. And, you know, like I said, whether it's charred black or whether it's natural rock, it's irrelevant almost to me because the fact that God would choose a different place to come down on. And this mountain hmm. absolutely stands apart from any of the others in the region. Next slide. And this was, uh, this was uh, the uh, 1992 trip when we made it to the top. To the left of the screen in the center, you can't see it that well, but that is the Gulf of Aqaba. So your vantage oh, wow. point and your view from that location is, and it's one of the reasons why I was trying to get to the top because we could not figure out the lay of the land. It was so mm -hmm. convoluted. Uh -huh. and so huge uh -huh. that to get, a, get a, a perspective of where we were and where all these things fit together, that's one of the reasons why we made it to the top. The next slide. Now this is something, uh, particularly for any of your viewers who may have seen pictures of this mountain, or because I'm telling you, it's all over the web. It's, it's, it is. There's, there's many, many, many websites and uh, various films and stuff that's been made thus far about this. But there's a confusion. When you're standing in the valley below and you're looking up, we've got it circled in red. Everyone thinks that in that circle is the top of the mountain. And in reality, it's nowhere near the top of the mountain. Really? These, these uh, areas Excellent. are so large. Yeah, go ahead. If that same circle, we are now up on the top looking down. And that circle that you see is the same black peak you just saw from the other side. Really? So it's really the first peak uh -huh. that you see from the valley. But, but the valley, the angles are so steep, you cannot see the real peak uh -huh. from the valley. Uh -huh. So we really wanted to open this up to everyone to show them that little thing where it says campsite, there's a tiny little blue dot in the middle uh -huh. of that little circle and that's our tent. <laughs> so we, were, we still kept climbing. That black Next peak slide. you see uh, the, the first peak you see from the valley the floor left. is on the left. That little blue tent is where that middle arrow is, and the real <sighs> top of the mountain is right up there. Oh, my God. So, uh, a mile and a half yeah. from the valley. It, it's enormous. And again, Moses could have been up there uh -huh. for 40 days and been missing yeah. uh, because there's no way that you would see yeah. him you mm -hmm. know, yeah. at, at the mm -hmm. top of the mountain. Yep. And then the next slide. And then this gives you a perspective of what we're talking about, the location. You see Mount Harb to the to the north of and Mount Sinai to the south of. And uh, just to put them on a geographical map and, and their relationship to each other. A little skewed north and south. Mount Horeb is, looks like granite. Is yes. it granite? Yes, it is. It is. It's a, it's a but Mount Sinai red granite. doesn't look like the same. Uh, it's actually no. a bluish stone uh -huh. that is a basalt. Uh, some, of the archae some of the geologists called it uh, original earth. That's what they call it. That was their name for it. And it has a blackened patina, uh -huh. which is uh, desert varnish, they call it, uh -huh. on it. But from the crater area, we talked about it in the roll-in, and you're, if you're in that place where we believe the 70 elders went, mm -hmm. where they could see God at a distance, mm -hmm. that stone has cast a blue hue that is very, very mm -hmm. much like the sky. And it talks about the sapphire pavement yes. under the feet of God yes. as being uh, blue or sapphire as if it were as clear as the heavens. And you can see that it blends right into the blueness of the sky. Just another, wow. yeah. just another yeah. little thing uh -huh. about this place that is so incredibly uh, significant. Do we want to? Yeah, let's go ahead. If you'll pull the next one up, this this was brought to our attention by Dr. Glenn Fritz. He's a very dear friend. 
Um, he is a, a geographer, um, PhD. He has a magnificent work he has just released called The Lost Sea of the Exodus. And it's a geogra uh, geographical analysis. And of course, he did most of his research on where the crossing site would have been. But he brought this to our attention uh, a number of years ago. And this is really profound, the insight he had about this particular thing. We were listening to a teaching on this last night, but this is from his, uh, as a geographer, he went back to the Greek and he studied this and he called us up one day and he was really excited. He said, guys, you will not believe what this says. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, Galatians 4.25. And 26, he says, where it says this Mount Sinai is in Arabia, nah, that's pretty self-evident, right? I mean, that that's Paul yeah. speaking. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. in, in Arabia. God made the difference that, between Arabia and Egypt. Yeah, <laughs> a, a lot bit. of difference, you would think. <laughs> and then he, and it says, to, and answereth to Jerusalem. He said that term is used once in the Bible, and it's a geog geography. It's a term that's used only in geography, where you're describing to march in a straight line. And he said the other term that's a once use in the Bible is above. And he said that means to the north of. So literally you could say that Jerusalem is north of Mount Sinai in a straight line due south. Uh -huh. So the next slide brings us to that line coming down from Jerusalem due south on the same line of longitude passes right between this Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai. Isn't that amazing? Oh, that is amazing. Isn't that, I mean, we, we saw that and just danced about for quite a while. How because literal the scripture is exactly. in, in its description. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. So again, you have to be at the right location to be able to determine these things. If you were looking for that, uh, that connection at the traditional site, it doesn't work mm -hmm. because right. it's to the southwest mm -hmm. of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make any sense. So again, you know, as we see these things unfold, it's amazing. Do we want to go to the uh, altar? Yeah, let's, let's go ahead. We're, we're doing well the, here. This will be the... Oh, you're talking about the, the video? Yeah, well, just, just a quick, on the photo that's up, we're seeing Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai, and then there's another box to the right at the bottom. It says, Altar Corral Pillars in Elijah's Cave. Just to let you know that it's located on the east side of, the, of Mount Sinai and where it is in, in uh, re relationship to the rest of it. So go ahead and roll the roll in altar pillars. Next to it is a slaughter platform and the altar. The stream bed can be seen running behind and around the corral as well as the white pillars out in front. From well inside the forbidden fence, I soon discovered the Saudis had completed a partial excavation of this site in 1996. You can plainly see the outlines of the slaughter platform and the corral directly behind it. Next to that is a pit, complete with layer upon layer of ash and the access area to the sacrificial altar. In Exodus 24, 5, young men sacrificed many oxen as peace offerings to the Lord there at Sinai. This large corral would have been necessary to lead them up to the slaughter platform. There they would have been sacrificed and the blood captured in basins, and Moses would have placed the offerings into the fire directly behind him. The altar itself was just beyond the fire, and there he sprinkled the blood. Just in front of the corral and the altars are the remains of white pillars and their foundation stones. We have found them to be made of a crude and discovered the source of this stone near the crossing side of the Red Sea. Moses built an altar and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel as recorded in Exodus 24:4. These pillars are each of differing sizes, possibly according to the number of each tribe of Israel that they represented. As you can see, they are very, very well preserved. Looking back upward from the altar area, a large cave is visible from